Welcome to the new world of work. I'm Adi Ignatius, Editor-in-Chief of Harvard Business Review. And each week on this show, we bring in a guest to talk about some aspect of the future of work, how we collaborate together, how we work more effectively together. We have a great guest this week, and I will introduce him in just a second. But first, a quick word from our friends at Unisys. When you think about how the cloud can help your business, are you thinking big enough? We can help you drive more value from the cloud. We're Unisys, and we do cloud really well. All right, I'm back. Uh, welcome again to the new world of work. Our guest today is Marcus Buckingham. Now, Marcus is a best-selling author. He's a very experienced researcher, particularly on workplace relations and workplace issues. He currently leads research at ADP Research Institute. He's the author of nine books, including a brand new one, Love and Work, How to Find What You Love, Love What You Do, and Do It for the Rest of Your Life. Full disclosure, Harvard Business Review Press is the publisher of that book. So, Marcus, welcome. Thank you very much, Eddie. All right, Happy it's great to, to have you. And these are big concepts, love and work. Yes. So what does love have to do with it? Plus, it's nice to be in the same room. I know, it? imagine. Like, we're, it's a we're, whole new... We're post-pandemic-ish. Kind of, yeah. Don't push the envelope. Um, yeah, love and work. I mean, well, first of all, just to be clear, from a research standpoint, there is no data that says that everybody who excels at what they do has to love all that they do. You know, the old cliche, find what you love and you'll never have to work a day in your life again. Yeah, that's not real. There, well, at least there's no data behind that. But what we do find, and really from the last 25 years of my career, when you, when you, when you do a study group focus group and you're studying highly successful people in any role, from housekeepers to teachers to lawyers to doctors or whatever, and you're interviewing them about what they do, you always find that there are moments, situations, or contexts that they love. That they don't love all that they do, but they do find love in what they do. And so that's the challenge for all of us. Is And it's not once a month. It's like this is an everyday thing. In fact, if you look at all the questions that might separate high-performing people from low-performing people, I mean, yes, people want a sense of mission, they want recognition, they want development, but the two most uh, discriminating questions in terms of high performing and low performing is, do I have a chance to use my strengths every day at work? And was I excited to go to work every day last week? So there's a frequency and an everydayness to finding love in what you do. And so that was, that's really what the point of the book was, is to go, you don't have to love all you do, but if you have a working situation where there's no love in it, you won't be creative, you won't innovate, you won't be resilient, all the outcomes that we want, you won't get with our love. So so that sounds great. And you know, I'm I'm willing to remake my my career along those lines. But yeah, you know, I've met people who just have this clear delineation, this separation between kind of the life they love and the work they do, but they're really good at their jobs. They come in, they do a great job, and then it's like five o'clock, I'm out of here. I mean. It, it, right. I mean, I mean, isn't that also a manifestation of, of successful work? Well, yes. And you hear that, of course, in like work life balance. Uh, I go to work. I'm not expecting work to love me back. Work isn't family. It's transactional. I go in, I sell my time and I my talent and I get the money and I go home and I, I provide for the people that I love. It's work life balance. But if you look at it in the real world, Adi, nothing healthy in nature is balanced. Everything's moving. So so health in general is motion it's how do you move through the environments and draw nourishment from those environments well for humans one of those big environments is work not all you've got other domains of your life but one of them is work you spend 40 50 60 hours a week doing something and what we know from from understanding people that are excelling at their job when they when they're doing something that they love the chemical cocktail in your brain the anandamide the vasopressin the norepinephrine uh, the dopamine, it that chemical cocktail looks almost exactly like when you're in love with someone. And we know when you're doing something that which you love, your brain is more, it's like your neocortex is dysregulated. And you're more open to new ideas and new innovations and creativity. And so all the stuff that we want from our work, the opportunity to feel like our, we are ourselves, the opportunity to open our minds to broaden and build and grow, all those only happen when you're doing something that you love. So you could, I guess, have 50 hours of lovelessness and you make a little trade for yourself where you go, well, look, I'm going to suck it up here so that I can provide over here. But it's a really bad calculus 
A, because you look at the most successful people, they don't do that. B, love's, an, love's a force. It needs to be expressed. And if you go to work and it's blocked, that's not neutral. You'll, you, over time, you become damaged by that. And the people that feel the damage most are the people at home. You know, it's not like you're taking your personal life to work. It's like, no, you're taking your lovelessness home. These people feel it. So it, it, it's not as though you have to have a life full of love at work. But if your entire 50 hours a week is, as you said, filled with competency, but no appetite, no joy, no passion, no love, uh, then you're a lesser human over time. It just, it, it drags you down. So if, if you're watching this, if you have questions for Marcus, put them into the, uh, the chat and we'll get to some audience questions later. Um, so I think there are companies who, who have tried to deal with this problem, you know, this, this lack of full engagement, mm. passion, love, whatever you call it, by empowering their workers. You know, we, we, we empower them at the front lines and that that will achieve better results and will make people feel, okay, I'm valued because I'm empowered to have flexibility in how I handle situations. I mean, is that, is that what you're talking about or is it something else? Well, certainly that direction is a good direction to go in. And more and more, the way that technology works, of course, is that we're automating some of the rote functions of most jobs. So you think about where technology fits in, indeed where AI and machine learning fits in, that does more and more apply to the parts of our jobs that are routine. Thus, leaving a lot more room for maneuver for many people in many jobs to use their judgment, to use their emotional intelligence, to use their authentic connection with a customer or a colleague. Like all of that is good, no question. But if you look at the way that we've built our human capital management systems inside companies, we haven't embraced the idea that your uniqueness and the unique things that you love. And by the way, if you took 30 emergency room nurses and you dove deep into what it is what is it that you actually love in what you do it's not and, and they're all great they don't all love the same it's not that they all love the same things they're all different they're all unique in terms of what drives them in terms of where they learn best in terms of how they best give care and what you would really want in a human capital system is something that when those loves of yours a they're real b they're really interesting and would like to figure out ways not that you do it all the time, but we'd like you to figure out ways in which you can express them at work every day in some way. And by the way, it appears that 20% is the threshold number. If you've got 20% of your activities in a day that are things that you love, you are far less likely to burn out, far less likely to attrit, far less likely um, have all those negative outcomes of lost work days and so forth. 20% is a good number. What you'd want is a human capital system that tries to help you find out what you love and express it, share it, I don't know, with your teammates. We don't see that at all. We see models of skills you're supposed to have, competencies you're supposed to have, uh, measurements of performance reviews against those competencies, which then expose your gaps. And then we tell you to, well, basically we say to you, success for you in this job is how closely you fit the model. Oh, by the way, we defined the model before you walked in. The model has nothing to do with who you are at all. You are supposed to match the model, which, which is understandable in the sense that you want everybody in the same job to deliver the same outcomes. Like there's a minimum requirement. But we've taken it beyond that so that basically your unique loves and everything that you felt was you about you, when you come into work, it's not just irrelevant to your performance. It's an impediment to you hitting the performance criteria that we've established. It's almost like we've said, Adi, that, that, that your uniqueness is a, is a bug, not a feature. And when you come to work, and as we've talked about over the years, all the way through college, this is true too, but anyway, at work, you're, you're basically told to put whatever your unique loves are aside and try to match the model that we defined before you walked in the door. Well, okay, so let me push on that a little bit. So I'm an editor. I have teams of editors who report to me. I, yeah. I, my hope is that they will edit things very successfully. Now, but here's a person and his loves are, you know, motorcycles and coin collecting. What do I do with that? I want him to, to be a great editor. Well, <laughs> A life with more love in it is a jolly good thing. So if he's got a hobby with motorcycles and coin collecting, and he's not good enough at coin collecting to quit your job and go be a professional coin collector, if there is such a thing, um, that's fine. That's called a hobby. A lot of us have things that we love that we're not good enough actually to be paid for, and that's not a, not a bad thing. It's a hobby, and a hobby is a love-bringing thing. So more love in your life, great. And, though, 
if you're leading your team of editors well, one of the questions that should be of interest to you, and I'm sure it is, is each one of them going, what is it about what you do that you love? Where did you, as Mike Chekshamahai said, where, when does time fly by for you as an editor? Um, when for you do you find yourself positively looking forward to something? When for you do you feel like, and you probably should know that about them, because for them that's part of, not only, but it's part of the nourishment that they bring to their work. And as you know, with your 10 editors or whatever, they're all really different. And so as you're thinking about assignments and you're thinking about ways in which you want to get them to do more or do better, starting with that which they love and their understanding of it and what they've shared with you is a really interesting way to help someone basically contribute, not only contribute over their best, but do it in a such a way that they get the nourishment to keep doing it. Their loves are like appetites and they're different I, I, and that's a good example. 10 editors. Well, they're just editors. No, they're 10 individuals who happen to be editors. And your job, of course, is to see them and then want them not to be better, as in, I'm going to fix you all so that you're one perfect homogenous editor, but to make them bigger. You want them to come into HBR and then go, OK, what's your unique contribution? If you don't actually talk to them about that, which they love in that conversation, you're missing one of the most important raw materials of their contribution, not, not the only one, uh, but you're missing a big one. So, so this moment we're in now, whether it's the great resignation or the great reshuffle, you know, people seem to prefer that now to yeah. the idea of mere resignation. D you know, to you, is that a manifestation of, uh, I don't know, the, the lack of, of empathetic leadership, of love, you know, in the workplace that's, that's driving people to either out or to look for new opportunities? Whether we call it the great resignation or the great reshuffle, undoubtedly over the last two and a half, three years, we are changed people. I mean, for many of us, I mean, for me, I sold my company, I lost my dad, I left my marriage, I had the same pandemic experience that many people did where you look in the mirror and you go, who the heck am I? And what sort of mark am I trying to leave? And some days, for many of us, the answer is pretty bleak. You're like, what am I doing? And other days, you, you sort of go, no, 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 no. I'm here for a really short time. I want to try to do something that's, that matters. And for many, many, many millions of us, we've come out of the pandemic and gone, I'm not a cog in a machine. I'm me. And I've had a really deep relationship with me over the last two years. Any CEO that thinks, oh, it's just, it's just press rewind and then we'll start again. And we'll just go back to normal because normal was so great. But for many of us, as we've seen in data relating to engagement, relating to resilience, normal wasn't so, even pre-pandemic. By the way, pre-pandemic, we had a burnout problem with doctors and nurses. Like it wasn't the pandemic that created, work wasn't really working for us pre-pandemic. Then the pandemic turned it up to 11. And then we sort of come out and gone, okay, look, we've got about 1.8, 1.9 openings for every person applying. So I've now got a bit of power. And I want to join a place that actually does, not, not in a soft woo-woo way, but does see me and is interested in what I love to do and how I can contribute it. Not that everything should be individualistic. It's not about narcissism. It's about contribution. So we've come out of this pandemic with a lot of us going, I think myself included, probably you included, going, uh, what is the unique dent I'm going to make here? And is there a company out there that is actually going to build their talent brand around that? Not that everyone's skipping to work. I mean, the old thing about they call it work for a reason, right? But I'm not going to go there and be emptied out. I'm just not. So for those companies who want to be the ones that attract the, the one person when they've got almost two job openings available to them, if the companies that want to really draw me in, they've got to speak directly to my, sorry, but I'll say it, they've got to speak directly to my heart. Are you really genuinely interested in me? By the way, dear hospitals, if your org structure is one nurse supervisor to 60 nurses, so you've you got that poor nurse supervisor is going to try to pay attention to the heart. You know, you said 10 editors, 60 nurses. How can that poor nurse supervisor even, even know their middle name or their, whether they're married or whatever, let alone what their unique loves about nursing are? So it, it's going to push companies to look at things like what a manager's doing, what's our performance management system look like, but also what's our org structure look like? Do our spans of control actively prevent any well-intended nurse supervisor from paying attention to the heart of another human? But those companies that do that well, genuinely, I am interested in who you are and what you bring. They will be, I think, in emotional sync with where many millions of us are. 
So one area where I think it gets complicated is, is you know, as companies try to connect more with their employees and understand that they have options, mm. uh, you know, part of it is the return to work question and whether you allow more people to work from home, if you kind of, you know, keep a, a hybrid thing going on, which in some ways seems to conflict with one of the ideas in your book, which is that we like to be together. We like to be in teams and we're, we're, we're sort of empowering people to, yeah, you're, you kind of, you know, it's not that you cannot have teams remotely. Of course you can, but it's different. So, so, you know, is that a caution, a cautionary, is this a cautionary moment to you? Well, no, from our data, what we know is, I mean, because I run this research institute funded by ADP, I can have an opportunity to go out and actually find data on that question. So we've just come out of the field with 27,000 people, 27 countries. And when you ask people whether or not they feel part of a team, unquestionably, if you feel part of a team, you're more likely to be engaged, more likely to be resilient. Um, but whether you work remotely or on site or hybrid doesn't seem to have any relationship to your feeling of being on a team. So it seems as though the feeling of team lives in the person, not the place. The other part about it, Adi, which is really interesting and important, is that when people say, what do you Right now, what do I want from work beyond salary and benefits? It's interesting in our data, at least, that seems to suggest they don't want necessarily flexibility of hybridness or not, remote or not. They're more interested in flexibility of hours. So it's maybe not that I want to work from home. It may be that I, in this new world, I want the freedom, whether I'm working on site on a construction site, whether I'm working in a restaurant, whether I'm working in an office, I want the freedom to be able to go back and deal with that life that you saw in my Zoom calls with my kid or my mom who's living with us. So I need the freedom of, of time, not necessarily the flexibility of working from home or not. So it seems as though if you, if you want to be meeting, if you're a company and you want to meet people where they are, yes, they want to be part of a team, but team actually can function remotely or not. A team is a function of a team leader seeing you and then collaborating doesn't necessarily have to happen around the water cooler. Um, and then the real thing is you're trying to give people uh, more trust. Love and trust are linked. And part of trust is flexibility of time. You give us flexibility of time to be able to accommodate the responsibilities that we have beyond the domain of our work. Okay, now I'm seeing you as a whole human. You're not head count. You're a human. And I've seen you've got a dog and you've got a gerbil. And then you got, a, you got a kid and apparently you have to pick the kid up from somewhere, right? Okay, now that's, that's an interesting thing for companies to start saying, no, no, I totally see you as a whole human. You've got a whole set of responsibilities and I'm right with you on that. How can we figure that out with you so that you can actually feel like we care even a little about the fact that your life doesn't begin and end when you walk through the office door, which I think pre-pandemic, we, we sort of felt like we were invisible. Once we went through the office door, now I can see you. And I think the pandemic really has changed all of that. But we will call you an FTE. <laughs> we will call you an FTE. Um, I know. So okay. So so languages. You, ugh, so no. um, so let's think about sort of the perspective of managers. So yeah. so you know your book is asking managers to love their employees. It's a term that will make some people feel squirmy. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, in super practical terms, you know, w w what does that mean? I mean, basically, you're, you're trying to get connect and and you know get the the best possible you know, into version of, of the employee you're working with. But but in practical terms, what does that mean, you know, to, to sort of show love to your employee? What does that look like? Well, to, so there's, we could talk all day about that, right? But the, the two things I would say here is one, it is a mindset thing. Like what is love for? What is a relationship for? Outside of work, inside of work. If you've ever been in a really loving relationship, you know that the other person sees you and wants you to be the bigger, the biggest version of that. They're not trying to perfect you. They're not trying to make you better. They're trying to make you bigger. And you feel like the bigness of you isn't them rewiring your brain to turn you into someone else. They're not trying to correct you, fix you, give you critical feedback so that you can see your blind spots. That's what spouses do. Yeah, exactly. Well, actually, in the best relationships, that's because there's a lot of studies on highly successful relationships. That's not what spouses do. That's what spouses do in relationships with more conflicts, less resolution and more stress. Um, the last thing you want to do in a spousal relationship is be in one where the person is like a, is like a detective telling you what the real reasons are for why you did what you did. Because then you're permanently kind of on edge, right? Going, because uh, they're probably right about some of it <laughs> too. So th the first thing for a manager is love in a relationship means I see you, I want you to be bigger. Sometimes it's tough love. So sometimes I'm going to tell you, 
what's right for you versus what you want. And, and, and I'm doing that because I want you actually to, so it's expectant and demanding. The second thing really practically for managers is, and this is true for you if you have kids, is frequency. When it comes to love, frequency trumps <laughs> intensity. You don't say to your people, hey, look, if you've got one really good day in a month, like one really good day, that should be fine. Remember that day a couple of months ago? <laughs> no. What the best managers seem to realize is I'm not going to talk to you every week. I've called it a check-in in the book, but it's 15 minutes of two questions. Hey, Adi, what'd you love last week and what'd you hate? And then what are you focused on this week? How can I help? 52 times a year. Really simple. Short-term past, short-term future. Short-term past, short-term future. When you look at the best leaders or team, team leaders, that's what they're doing. They're going, what you love last week? Because love lives in the detail. Please don't tell me you like executive presence or I really love strategy. It's like, what, 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 what does that mean? Last week, what'd you love? Because there's a whole bunch of stuff you did last week. Name anything, anything. Well, you already know, Marcus. No, no, I, no, I don't actually. Tell me that and then tell me what your priorities are next week so that together we can try to make sure that you maintain your intensity and to some extent, this is pragmatic on the manager's part. They want to make sure that week number 36 is this kind of uh, for you as week one. But it is like a weekly, gosh, if we could just wave the magic wand with your show here, we would just make every manager go, if you can't check in with every one of your people, one by one, every week, and then don't be a manager. You want, to, you want to look right at the camera and say that? Yeah, if you can't check <laughs> in. <laughs> so, but in all seriousness, we've overcomplicated what it means to lead. What, what it is to lead is, you check in with somebody every week for 52 weeks out of the year. And if you think to yourself, well, I'm, I'd love to do that, but I'm too busy leading, th then you've missed the point. Like that, This is leading. And if this is boring, like the stuff that's the strategic part of leadership that you could do in a shed, in the bottom of the garden, all by yourself, good, Adi, go do that. Right? But the part which is getting to your 10 editors and making them be like way better, I'm sorry, that's a frequent light touch you to them, you like them and their work, them and their work, them and their, but 52 times a year, like that's leading. And if you don't like that, don't lead people. Go sit in the shed at the bottom of the garden and we'll bring in a person who can lead the editors. But that's what it is because humans, you know, humans feel seen by other humans. We've just, we, we've missed the power of frequency when it comes to seeing what a person loves and how they can turn it into contribution. And we've lurched into sort of these big generalizations of, you know, I love strategy or I love, you know, challenge. And it's like, where is that going? I love, when it comes to love in relationships, it's not general, is it? It's very specific. I love the way that they hold their handbag or I love the way that they whistle when they're, you know, calm. I love the way that they wear a suit. You know, it's, love is very specific. Love lives in the details. But it's weird when it comes to work, managers often resort to, you know generalizations ah oh, he loves challenge like what sort of challenge doing what um so the the check-in is a way to keep the detail of the person in the work like front and center for the whole year um that's great so we're, we have a lot of good questions coming in i'm gonna turn to a couple right now okay cool um so this is one this is from uh johannes r uh who is watching on youtube how do we choose between a job that we love but the pay is average and a job that is okay, but pays better and therefore enables a better lifestyle. Well, Johannes, um, that's the age old question, isn't it? It's like, do you take a really high paying job? It's like going to work in finance or something. I hate finance, but you know, <laughs> it's going to pay me five times as much as the coin collecting role that I really want to do. Um, the, I mean, and everyone's different. You got to make your own trade, but if your trade is, there's nothing I love about finance at all. This finance job, it pays me a ton. But my day to day, I call them in the book, I call them red threads. So any job isn't just a job with a job description. It's made up of thousands of different activities, moments, situations. It's like a fabric. And some of the situations are, uh, are black, gray, white, green, yellow. They lift you up a little, they lift you down a little. But some of these threads are red. And those threads are activities that lift you up. When you're doing them, time flies by. When you're in the middle of them, you feel mastery and they, and they last 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 10 minutes. If, if Johannes's job has none of those, and he's looked, he's done, he's taken a blank sheet of paper around with him for a week, he's drawn a line down the middle, he's written loved it and then loathed it. He took around with him for a week or two weeks and on the loved it list, there's nothing. Then what I would say to you, Johannes, is that's a bad trade. 
because by the time you're, I'm just going to do it for five years. I'll have a loveless life at work for five years, but I'll earn a lot of money and then I'll quit and I'll open the bed and breakfast in wherever. By the time you quit, you're damaged. By the time you quit, you're a different person because you've had, you've had five years where for 40, 50 hours a week, you are not yourself. Your love unexpressed isn't neutral. It's a caustic force. Like all forces, it should flow. If it doesn't flow, it's not neutral. It like eats you up. If you've ever been in a relationship where there's no opportunity for you to express that which you love, it feels deeply alienating and destructive. So if you've looked really hard for love in your work, even though it's not the quintessence of what you want to do, but you look hard for those little red threads and you found none and you keep finding none, then uh, no matter how much money you're getting, it's not enough because it's destroying you as a human and the people around you that you think you're fooling, they know it. They might even know it before you do. So start by trying to find the red threads. And if you can find someone you're well paid, well, okay, well, that's now interesting because you're getting nourishment, psychological nourishment. All right, here's another good question. This is from uh, Susanna from Angola. And the question is, what if I love my job but have a terrible boss? Ah, <laughs> that's a tricky one, isn't it? Because when you think about love, love has to be received. Like somebody has to see it almost in order for you to be able to feel comfortable expressing it. We uh, know for sure that you develop uh, in response to another human being. And often that human being at work is a boss. So the question for you is if you deeply distrust your boss, all the data that we would have would suggest that if that's a persistent condition, like you've tried to come to the boss and go, hey, listen, I don't think you trust me. Or, hey, listen, I don't think you even see what I love to do. And you, you seem singularly uninterested in it. And you, and you maybe have suggested some things that you might do together so that you can have a chance to contribute more. Because remember, the point of love is it's a precursor to contribution. Love turns into performance. I mean, that's, it's a precursor to performance. So if you've had that conversation with your manager and your manager still is like, I don't, you know, I'm going to keep you down. I'm going to keep you down. Then I'm afraid in the end, um, because we develop best in response to another human being, if that human being um, is a person that you don't trust and that wants to control and stifle you, you actually do have to leave your boss, which is why in the end, many people do up and leave their boss or flipping that around. It's why they often follow a really good boss mm -hmm. from one company to another, because that person is so, you know, quintessential to my feeling of, are my loves even interesting to them? And do they want to turn them into contribution in any way? So yeah, in the end, the reality is bosses do matter. Mm -hmm. All right. One more question from uh, the audience. This is from Roxana from Solana beach, California. Oh. Hi, Solana beach. <laughs> and uh, Marcus, I know you have kids. So the question is, her question is, how can I help my kids find what they love in their future careers? Oh, wow. Roxana, um, that is an amazingly good question. I mean, one of the promptings for the book actually was, I was talking to my daughter about, because obviously during the pandemic, many kids turned to their parents for help with various su subjects. So my daughter was this is asking me about geometry and what's the difference between a parallelogram and a rhombus. And I remember thinking, A, I have no idea. And B, wow, someone spent 10 years on geometry with my kid. Like someone took geometry, some curriculum designer somewhere 20 years ago <laughs> took geometry so seriously. There's 10 years of lessons on it and language and routines and rituals and formulae. And it's like, whoa, somebody took geometry incredibly seriously, which is great. I'm a big fan of numbers. Um, but no one taught her about her. No one. She's got no language to describe that which she loves. She's got no language to describe how to who should turn to her for what, where she loves to be asked to step into herself, where is she at her best, where is she like a deer in the headlights, all that. There's, there's nothing. There's nothing at all. So for parents, first of all, just know the schools, sorry schools, but they're not interested in the kid in, in the loves of the kid. They're interested in the kid achieving a certain grade point average, passing standardized tests so that they can go on to the next level at college, et cetera. So it does fall on you actually and the best way to think about finding what your kid loves is two things. One, believe that they're there. If you've got more than one kid, you'll know these kids are really different in that which they love. And that same mom, same dad, really different patterns of loves and loads. It's weird, right? It's No one sort of talks to you about that. But one of the biggest questions is, why am I different from my brother? And if I wanted to be more like him or less like him, could I be? How, how much can I rewind my, rewire my brain to be like him? So the first thing is just know those loves are there. And second, frankly, when it comes to parenting, lovemaking is space making. 
So your challenge really, I know this, I don't know your kids, Roxana, but how can you leave enough space for them to make choices? Because every time they make a choice, you can see a love. Every time you every time you make a rule, you take away a choice. Now you need some rules, but every time you make a rule, you take away a choice. Every time you take away a choice, you take away an opportunity to see the loves of your child. So can you become the most intelligent as a parent, the most intelligent space maker, so you can see what the kid chooses? And then over time, of course, those patterns of choice, I, I'm sure you've seen this with your kids, the patterns of choice aren't random. They change a wee bit, but they're part of patterns. And so if we can start to see the patterns of the kids' choices as parents, wow, what a great way to help that kid have a language to talk about themselves when they need to pick a major, when they need to, to go through a job interview. Uh, great answer. So uh, let's, let's go back to the workplace. Um, so, you know, there are plenty of managers who sort of manage lightly and then, you know, every year or a couple of times a year, they're called on to evaluate and, you know, give a number rating to... Uh, to the people on their team. Now, I know from your books that you're not a fan of that system, but I, I wanna hear the Marcus critique of why that's not a good approach and what might be a better approach. You mean like the yearly or biannual sort of performance yes. appraisal? Yes, performance review, yes. Well, that's still sort of everywhere, yeah. right? 80% of companies have some sort of yearly performance evaluation of some kind. And um, the, I mean, this is quite fresh for me because a, a, a friend came in the other day and was, and and, She's a, a very effective person at her job. In fact, she was so effective that her company had done, had included with a few other folks, a time and motion study of how she was doing her job because she was so good at it. So she was all chuffed, you know, and she was coming in for her yearly evaluation. And I think quite liked her manager too. But she was coming in going, I hope I get a 4% raise because if I'm good, that's what they give you, you know, versus that 2% raise, 4%. Now, regardless of whether or not there's any motivational power in the difference between two and four that's what she was going in for well so she came out and i was like how how was it for you and she goes well apparently i'm a three and i'm like what do you mean you're a three she goes exactly that's what i said what do you mean i'm a three so they have a seven point scale where uh, it's inverted so one is really good and seven is bad and the person said well um or her boss said well we don't really give sevens and sixes because you're sevens and sixes you're five and no one really gets a one uh, so you're kind of you know you're upper echelon in the middle part and she's like, what are you talking about? You, I was in the time and motion study as a, as a study group. I was one of the excellent ones. And they went, yes, well, you're probably actually a two, but we'd actually run out of twos. <laughs> and so you could think of yourself as a two, but we just didn't have any left. Because we, and she said, what do you mean? Well, we forced the curve. Because otherwise every manager is going to give everyone a two or a one, aren't they? So we can't have that. So therefore you're a three. And she, you could, I mean, she was so, and she got the, you know, she got the 2% raise, not the 4% raise. So there was that part of it that was damaging. But also on a human level, Adi, it was like, I'm not a three. I'm actually not even a two. And we know from data that even the ones follow, following a performance appraisal, their performance goes down more than 30%, even when they're a one, because they walk away going, I'm not a number. Don't do an, and the, the problem with all this is that we've, we've kludged together performance measurement with performance development. Performance measurement, if you wanna do it once a year so that you can hand out variable comp, okay. I don't think you need a rating number to decide who gets the 2% versus the 4%. Like you could just go straight to the 2% and the 4%. But if you wanna do that once a year, cause that's the cadence of the way that you do your finances. All right, performance development though, as we were talking about with the check-in. I mean, if you looked at the last dance with Phil, with Phil Jackson he, uh, and, the, and the Bulls, six championship rings, not because Phil Jackson was like, well, they don't need any help from me. They're just, they're the best ever. Off you go. You don't need me to check up on you. But instead he's like, no, 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 you're Michael Jordan and you need me to check in with you after every game, pretty much every game. How'd that work? Should we tweak that? Should we alter that? We... If you really looked at performance development done well, it's frequent in the moment, the person and the work, it, there's the, the, the tweaks and the adjustments and the course correction, not long. This isn't like a burden on managers. It's just like, no, no, pay attention to what the person is doing in the work all the time and tweak and adjust because that's performance development. Well, the problem with these performance, once a year performance reviews, you shove both of those together. Not only does my friend go in and come out going, apparently, you know, I'm a three, um, but also she has to then store up all the stuff that she might want to talk about in terms of her career or in terms of her progress for the next year. And then she has to sort of, and it gets so anxiety inducing for managers and employees because they both know it's like a pressure cooker. 
it's been building and building and building and building. And then those poor managers too have to sit down and go, I've got to answer every single bloody question that she's got because she knows and I know that she knows that I know that she knows that I know. And we're not going to talk about it again for a year. So our timing is all off. Our humanity is off. And then the, the point of these different functions is off. Solve for performance measurement and solve for performance development. And you'll end up with two really different looking systems. Shove them together and you end up doing both of them really, really badly. Yeah, that's a great critique. So we're actually over time. There are tons more questions. Oh, I know it goes so fast. There are a lot more questions I can't get to. But Marcus, thank you for oh, being our time, guest yeah. this week on The New World of Work. I loved it. All right. So um, that was Marcus Buckingham. He is the author of many books, but the new book, Love and Work. And if you like this stuff, check it out because uh, a lot of really interesting analysis of of what what of, of how office places don't work and, and how they could work with just a little tweaking. And maybe the big takeaway is, you know, meet with your reports 15 minutes once a week and uh, and really sort of talk to them, really listen to them. And it's not that hard. And if you don't like doing that, you probably shouldn't be a manager. I like that takeaway. So uh, we'll be back next week. Our guest next week is Hamdi Ulakaya, who is the uh, CEO of Chobani. Very interesting guy, um, uh, very active in a lot of social issues, particularly uh, on behalf of refugees, both in the U.S. and globally. So that is next Wednesday, April 20th, 12 noon Eastern time. I hope you tune in. If you'd like this content, um, subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, go to hbr.org slash newsletters for more. Um, and again, thank you for joining us. See you next week. This is the new world of work.